Good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, ARCUS, where Arctic research is connected since 1988. My name is uh, Bob Rich, and I'm the executive director. Um, can you go around the other way? Thanks. Go around the other door. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so thank you so much for coming to uh, our 21st Arctic Research Seminar Series presentation in Washington, D.C., where we're delighted to welcome Matthew Jewell. ARCUS connects Arctic research across boundaries through communication, coordination, and collaboration, providing the essential and tangible infrastructure required for research to advance. We're a not-for-profit consortium working together to promote exploration and understanding of the Arctic. Whether you're here or online, uh, we invite each of you to become an ARCUS member. All types of organizations are eligible to become ARCUS members, including academic institutions, government agencies, corporations, and indigenous organizations. Also, any individual who shares our enthusiasm about the importance of Arctic research can become an Arctic mem ARCUS member. I invite each of you to join us. You can find out more online at www.arcus.org. This seminar series is designed to provide unique access to a wide range of leading Arctic researchers and leaders for federal officials, members of the DC policy community, and the broader public interested in the changing Arctic. The ideas shared here represent the cutting edge of what we're exploring and learning up north, and also what it means for the US and the rest of the world. If you're in the room, you should have received when you checked in a seminar evaluation. I would please ask you to complete those at the conclusion of the seminar and return them to the registration desk. And if you're online, I uh, encourage you to stick around for a few seconds after the seminar presentation to complete the evaluation. We uh, value your feedback and would uh, always are looking for more information about how to plan the best possible seminars for you. Um, for those of you on Twitter, we would encourage you to use the hashtag uh, ArcusWebinar to discuss the event. Today we're joined with more than 80 registered participants in at least 13 U.S. states and in Canada, Finland, France, Greenland, the Netherlands, Norway, Russia, Spain, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. So a real global group of interest. For those of you on the webinar, my colleagues are available to answer any questions that you have about ARCUS or Arctic research and to forward to us here in DC any questions for Matthew. You'll have the opportunity to submit the questions by typing them in the questions pane of your attendee control panel. You can send your questions at any time during the presentation. You don't need to wait till the end. We'll collect them and address them during the Q&A session. I need to acknowledge our uh, partners. I'm delighted to thank the Consortium for Ocean Leadership which enables us to use this excellent meeting space, and the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Polar Research Board for help with uh, registration. Of course, I want to thank the National Science Foundation's Division of Polar Programs for major financial support to ARCUS and to this seminar series. Now, let me introduce our speaker. Uh, briefly summarize as many accomplishments of full bio as online. Matthew Jewell is Assistant Professor of Architecture at the University of Virginia School of Architecture and Founder and Co-Director of the Arctic Design Group. Jewell received his Master's of Architecture from Harvard University and his PhD from Cambridge University. His design work has been widely recognized, including being nominated for the 2016 European Prize for Urban Public Space, honorable mention in the Helsinki Guggenheim International Architectural Competition, and many more. He's affiliated with the Scott Polar Research Institute at the University of Cambridge, the NSF Pyre Network on Ar Arctic Urban Sustainability, and the NSF uh, Research Coordination Network on Arctic Urban Sustainability. Without any further ado, please join me in welcoming to the Arcus DC Arctic Research Seminar Series, Matthew Jewell, to tell us about the Arctic Design Group Mediating Environments. Thanks, Bob. Thanks so much. Um, it's fabulous to be here, uh, and Bob, I want to thank you for the opportunity, and also Arcus for coming up to DC to talk about um, our work. Um, so I, um, in this talk, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the, uh, and provide an overview of the Arctic Design Group, what we've been up to, um, what our goals are, and uh, some of the outcomes of some teaching uh, and the studios that we've been uh, carrying out at, at UVA. Um, but to begin with, the first thing I want to start with is uh, I started actually not as a designer, but as a geophysicist. Uh, this is Iceland. Uh, and working on understanding the uh, geochemistry and dynamics of the Earth uh, in active volcanic zones. And 
you know, to look at um, images like this, this is a volcanic eruption in Chile, and to look at the associated responses, uh, this is from a, the Grimsfeld eruption in 2011, of where, you know, people were annoyed that uh, volcanoes were in some ways uh, inhibiting or spoiling their vacations, struck me as, as a kind of attitude, which is where we have uh, collectively believed the environment is sort of an inconvenience. Um, and I think in a way that sort of underscores uh, some of the um, ways in which we think about the Arctic uh, as, as an environment. Um, this is a, an image of Fryado. He's a 2015 Pritzker Prize winner uh, in architecture. And this is him looking at a model uh, of an Arctic city he had designed. And the idea of the Arctic city was an entirely a huge enclosed two kilometer dome with 40,000 people living in a hermetically sealed bubble. And the you know, complete with a nuclear power station and polar bears and icebergs for to complete the picture. But ultimately, you know, this view, um, which I think uh, for those who don't live in the Arctic, uh, is one of a perception that the environment is to be uh, feared or to be negated. Uh, and I think that in a way this has influenced uh, or drives some of our, um, um, our work in the Arctic Design Group to understand how we can think about the built environment in a way that is more um, uh, responsive, maybe more sustainable. The Arctic is a fascinating uh, landscape, as many of you know. Uh, I'm sure, uh, having visited the Arctic on a number of occasions uh, with our work, uh, permafrost with uh, an incredibly interesting dynamic ground condition, um, extremes of temperature um, and light uh, and materiality, where water and liquid and solid, uh, uh, you know, vary continuously. Um, Landscapes that have been uh, molded and sculpted from you know, intense forces, uh, cyclical processes of freezing and thawing, and from past glacial cycles, um, and resulting in really incredible um, uh, geomorphological features that, in a way, you know, emphasizes and reveals uh, very strong uh, environmental processes that are at work. Now, for people who live in the Arctic, uh, people who have built cities, the conditions are extremely challenging. This is an image from, I believe, Norilsk. Um, and how do you actually live or uh, create livable environments within this, uh, the extreme conditions? Now, there is a long legacy of living in the Arctic. Um, the Inuit and, and other indigenous groups, the Nupiat, have lived there for thousands of years um, and developed incredibly sophisticated techniques through clothing and through uh, ways of building shelters that have uh, are, are so intelligent, so smart, and it puts what we're doing now in a way, um, it maybe makes you kind of pause and think, how can we potentially learn from some of these uh, past techniques um, and learn from the wisdom of the uh, indigenous people who live there? Um, but we do know, though, is that the Arctic is changing. Um, sea ice is retreating. Uh, this is projection of the reduction in sea ice over, I believe, the next 100 years. Um, and, you know, associated with that, uh, this is directly a result of climate change, and associated, associated with that um, is, we flip this graph around, is opportunity. People view the Arctic opening up, shipping, economic development. Um, what, does this, what does this mean? How does the Arctic, what is its future? Well, one of the things that's happening uh, is increased uh, thawing of permafrost and erosion and uh, impacting on uh, way of life of people, uh, particularly in Alaska. This is an image from Shishmaref, which is being subjected to um, permafrost thaw and coastal erosion because of the, the reduction in the time frame of the sea ice uh, on, the, on the coast. Um, but you also have increased economic development, industrial and mining. Um, land claim grabs with the uh, Russians putting down uh, a flag of the North Pole, which is a, it's a kind of a beautiful image, but also uh, indicates or emphasizes the contested territory of the Arctic. Um, images such as this, uh, a view of the Arctic from, from the Chinese perspective, one of the permanent observers in the Arctic Council. Uh, interesting to, to see that there are many ways to look at the Arctic, depending on where you're from, um, and that, that it is in a place of incredible global importance. Tourism is exploding. Um, I just returned from a, a trip to Iceland to understand that in a city uh, or in a very small country, beautiful country, um, where uh, 
taxi drivers in Reykjavik don't exactly know where the hotels are located because they're springing up so fast to accommodate the massive increase in tourism that's happening. And this is actually having quite a large impact on the environment in the, in the country. Um, and so as the eight Arctic nations come together and the permanent observers, uh, the question is for us as designers, where are we at this table as the future of the Arctic is being determined? This is an image from Dr. Strangelove, uh, policymakers, private business, et cetera, at the table. And our question for us is, where is design situate itself here? Uh, so it's a doctored Dr. Strangelove image. Um, anyway, so my attempt at humor. But OK, so uh, the thing that's actually really important, though, uh, to understand, and this, I'm going to sort of wind back a little bit to our research before getting into some design projects later in the, um, the talk. The Arctic is a very heterogeneous place um, in terms of development. In this graph, you can see on the left uh, the population of typical uh, several of the North American uh, settlements, Iqaluit and Barrow. Uh, and on the right, you see the, the population of uh, Russian settlements to, that were formed during the Soviet Union, uh, 300,000 versus 3,000. So the difference in the morphology and type of uh, settlement and uh, built environment is extreme. Uh, this is an image from Barrow showing a kind of a suburbanized condition uh, with a street grid. And there you have an image from Norilsk with an entirely different morphology of city um, built under very, very different political, social, and economic conditions um, as a mono industrial town. You can actually see the uh, nickel mining in the background, a kind of Mordor, but, but uh, some beautiful ideas that were developed in the, in the process of. of designing and building the city. Um, the comparison between the fabric, between the North American on the left and the Russian um, uh, urbanism on the right is remarkable. And I think there's something that we can learn from both models of development as we look to the future in the Arctic. What happened in the, in the Russian Arctic, though, is, is quite an interesting lesson. Um, groups of architects, uh, such as these, uh, for Norilsk, uh, and uh, Forced labor uh, produced massive cities uh, built on permafrost um, and incredibly innovative techniques through a process of trial and error where they're building cities um, that were no one had ever done before. And there's so many incredibly interesting lessons to be learned from the Russians about what had gone on in the early part and the middle part of the 20th century. In Alaska, the situation was quite different in terms of the scale and type of, um, uh, of architecture and buildings that were developed. There's a kind of an imported legacy of imported models of housing that has been moved to the Arctic and plopped down. And you can see this one with this very subtle sag in the center as it's sinking into the permafrost in Fairbanks. So, so clearly, there are many issues regarding, this is just one example, issues regarding the design of buildings and how they um, need to be better thought of in terms of the uh, environment, unique environmental conditions. The other end of the extreme for North America, and this is in, from Resolute Bay in Canada, is to create a kind of hermetically sealed box uh, that's sort of hyper uh, um, insulated and uh, conditioned. And so the environment becomes a kind of decorative window shade. You can see in the back of the image. And, and ultimately, you're kind of living in a plastic bag. Uh, this is something that is very difficult. The environmental conditions in the Arctic to, to, to build and insulate and treat water vapor is very challenging. Uh, and so this is one thing that designers look at in terms of how to, how, to, how to overcome. One of the really the few architects that has done in the past incredible work on the Arctic is Ralph Erskine. He was a Swedish architect who died about 10 years ago. Um, and he had incredible ideas for designing uh, buildings in, a, in cold climates, northern conditions. Um, and ideas that were really based on um, thinking about materials, about about uh, heat, about thermodynamics, um, and thinking about efficiencies and compactness, which I think we are still learning from now. Um, ideas for you know large cities uh, in the Arctic that uh, were actually only partially realized in northern Canada, but I think still um, trying to find a new model of living uh, and developing an architecture that is more responsive to the extreme conditions. Here's a kind of set of sections that talk about um, the corner between a building um, and how 
uh, wind and snow accumulation might be affected depending on the design of that, that condition. So very sort of careful and thoughtful considerations of environmental conditions. And that will come back to this in a little bit. So the Arctic Design Group is, uh, is a research group we, Lena Cho and I started in 2012 um, at the University of Virginia. And uh, Lena, my uh, co-director of the, and partner is co-director of the Arctic Design Group. We've been working to um, establish a framework for, our, uh, for how design can operate in the Arctic region. And one of the first things to do was to make a strategic map uh, to understand um, key areas and zones and boundaries uh, of the Arctic region, and then to identify uh, areas that we would be focusing on to study in our work, to understand how, as designers, we can begin to engage in the conversations that are happening. And one of the things that we've been doing is, um, through a series of exhibitions um, and conferences, uh, is bringing designers together um, and beginning to develop a, a network of, uh, of um, uh, collaborators uh, from the design profession to look at how we can more effectively uh, address the question of what future settlements and developments would be like in the Arctic. So through kind of uh, projects and, and uh, conferences in northern Russia, uh, this is up in Terraburka last summer, where some of the smaller uh, communities are looking at exploiting the increase in tourism and opportunities for marketing the Arctic are important. Uh, we've been engaging with people there, um, also in Yakutsk, um, really incredible city that has some of the coldest temperatures on Earth, um, and working with students there uh, who are interested in looking at models for the post-Soviet city. How do you create more livable spaces in cities that were des designed um, primarily through a kind of social and economic drivers, but trying to update them so that in a way um, the quality of life is better for people living? Um, so just I'm going to bump through these quickly. So like, there is some past research as well we've been doing on, again, Russia, so many lessons to be learned. I'm going to skip through these guys. Um, and also looking at, at many of the influences that have happened between what happened in the Soviet Union and also some of the, the models for development that were actually transported over to uh, northern Canada by Ralph Erskine. So this work is, is actually, I'm kind of currently in the process of writing a book. Uh, that is uh, kind of in the process of being finished, hopefully by the end of the month, uh, by the end of April. But um, it's kind of an exciting moment. Um, but simultaneously to this kind of background context research, uh, Lena and I have been taking students up to the Arctic because we believe that education is a critical part of understanding uh, with our students and also future leaders in design and other professions is what is this nature of this of the Arctic and what are the challenges it faces. So this is a trip to Sval Svalbard. Um, this is a video which So maybe on the webinar, the sound is not coming through, but this is uh, one of our students uh, who was putting together a video. We asked our students to, uh, when we take them on our uh, field research trips, to actually put together a very clear documentation of uh, what they've experienced and understood about the environments. That was in Barentsburg in, in northern Norway. Uh, and he was talking about how the, the just the degree of uh, impact on the environment industrialization, industrialization has had. Um, to um, also looking at, you know, kind of contemporary models of, of design and construction in Northern Europe, which is quite, quite interesting in terms of the innovations that are happening and how we can learn from those models. Um, also, uh, this past fall, taking students to Alaska and doing a transect from south to north, from Anchorage up to Uktiavik, uh, known as, from the known as Barrow, uh, to understand the uh, differences, changes of the climate and environment, and also how that's influenced the built environment. So here we are at the Cold Climate Housing Research Center uh, with Jackie Bear, the director, amazing uh, guy, uh, and also uh, so many talented people working there on uh, innovation, innovative technologies for, for designing buildings uh, in the Arctic. We traveled up to Minto as well during this trip, which is a small Athabascan community north of Fairbanks, to learn about the village, the community there, and, uh, and learning really about how Native Alaskans uh, perceive the environment and how what are the what are the inadequacies of many of the structures that have been built and the way that communities have been developed in the past. 
Um, also working up a meeting with people at NOAA. This is up in Barrow to learn about the kind of current science experiments. So, you know, our students are sort of absorbing all of this, these, uh, uh, this information and translating it through into their designs. That's one of the kind of key goals. Um, the next part I'm going to talk about um, is really just a kind of, this kind of stems a little bit from my, uh, you know, background in geophysics, but also the, the, you know, our belief, Alina and I, our belief that to move forwards, we need to understand the, the basic kind of processes that are shaping the environment in the Arctic, um, looking at heat, light, uh, precipitation, sunlight, we call fundamentals, and having our students begin uh, to understand the, the place by first understanding the processes um, through a set of experiments, and even just understanding the idea of heat, uh, uh, um, how it's transferred through conduction, radiation, and convection, um, understanding the and developing physical apparatus to understand atmospheres and evaporation, uh, freezing and thawing processes. Um, this is a kind of crazy experiment on, on understanding particle dispersion. And um, again, it's, it's to kind of, you know, the interesting thing about uh, design in a way is, is you know, it's, it's very experimental. It's like a kind of laboratory uh, environment uh, to learn about the environmental processes and then to translate into a physical space. Um, this is a kind of nice simulation where one of the students was looking at um, the, the flow of, uh, of snow and how it might interact with a, with a physical structure. This is a micro rayon from, uh, in a book from, from, from Russia. Um, again, a few more sort of examples of simulations that are, that are, that are ongoing within the, the studio environments. So the last section of my talk um, is going to be looking at some projects that are pro f primarily focused on Alaska. Um, there's a really incredible quote here from Jack Huber, um, where you know, he says, a house is not a home, a house is a place within home, and the land is home. And you know, I think that's an interesting perspective to take in terms of thinking about how um, we, um, as Southerners, view um, buildings and environment and how Native Alaskans would view the environment. Um, what you see in, in you know, many rural parts of Alaska are incredibly difficult conditions in which people are living. Um, health, uh, unhealthy kind of environments. Um, and you understand that, that really the models in the past of, of buildings uh, that have been imported into the Arctic, into Alaska, have, are really not serving the people there well, um, even in the face of climate change. So one of the things, though, that uh, one project that um, a group of really talented students, uh, one of our students was working on, was to look at past models of houses. This is a kind of model study. Of a, of a HUD house, um, and then they began to critique that model and to develop a new model of a house based on their a kind of super in-depth research on uh, aspects of uh, uh, um, Inupiaq culture as well as environmental conditions, and to develop a whole new set of systems. I won't go through all of this, but you can understand that, that you know, through a kind of, from looking at uh, the house that was shown earlier, they're looking at kind of new types of social space and vertical stratification in terms of heat, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, why not enter a building from below than from the side if you're in cold climates? Just it's, it's kind of fairly straightforward thermodynamic argument. Um, and again, developing ideas for housing, which I think are really exciting. Um, I won't go into all of these, but you kind of get a sense of the type of work that's kind of going on. The other um, thing that's actually quite, quite interesting is to, it, it, is to explore just the public space or exterior spaces in communities. Um, and uh, in the Arctic, one of the things that's, that's a critical thing to consider is on permafrost, you have to build buildings above the ground unless you have some active cooling mechanism in the ground to stop the ground from melting. But what this does uh, is to create a kind of um, strange disconnect between the, um, the, the ground plane and where the buildings are. Everything's on stilts, basically. And these students were looking at rethinking the design of the ground plane. And what's really beautiful about the image on the top, if you look at it as it's kind of evolving, is they started to think about the design of a community not based solely on a fixed ground plane, but one that's constantly evolving from season to season because the presence of snow and mud and all the different materials is always changing and melting. So, so further examples of some sections through the, the community. Um, 
I look at the different positions between buildings and ground. And I, I probably won't go through all the details on that, but you can kind of get a glimpse of, of the kind of studies that are kind of going on. But So the other thing that's actually really critical is to uh, ask, uh, ask our students to explore visually and create uh, physical models that describe conditions within the spaces, uh, within the communities that they're studying. Um, and so there are a lot of interventions in terms of how they can, you know, really begin to convey ideas. And, and again, some, so this, this idea of public space, which oftentimes is considered to be a neglected space uh, within uh, um, many of the northern communities we visited, could become a, a, um, a new medium to, to strengthen communities. Two more projects to I'll go through. One is uh, on sc uh, schools. This is uh, an image from a school from Minto. Um, you can see an absence of windows. Uh, a kind of many of the there are changes that are happening, but there are some fairly inadequate models of schools that have been uh, designed uh, in northern regions. Um, and these students were looking at the cycle, seasonal cycles of the Athabascan um, uh, in, in, in the area north of uh, Fairbanks and understanding how the environment could be more cu closely coupled with the school itself and the, the learning activities of, of children. So they developed a set of modules of, of different types of spaces and conditions within the school. And we're using that as a kind of uh, motivator to explore how a new, new typology of school could be developed just through kind of greater integration, through seasonal variation, through heat, um, through materials, and producing um, design proposal such as this, which is a, uh, a kind of, this is a roof removed from the school, but, but you know, it has a whole series of ideas about thinking about heat and about light and about integration with the surrounding environment, which I think uh, is a big step forward um, from, from what has kind of currently done. The last project uh, I'll show is, uh, is an image from, uh, it's on Shishmaref. We had a studio a few years ago that were looking at the kind of effects of climate change on the community and what it meant for relocation. Shishmaref is located on the west coast of Alaska and has a, a, it's on a barrier island and uh, it's eroding very rapidly. This classic image uh, is basically a, a really clear manifestation of what's happening as the kind of coastline is, is, is eroded. Um, but one of the things that's, that the community is challenged with is the fact that to stay in place and fortify the island And, but to move to another uh, uh, site, it's about 200 million. So it's a very difficult situation. How do you, what, what are they supposed to do? Um, and there is no clear answer to this question. But in the process of exploring and understanding what's happening in Shishmaref, um, it became clear to us that there are a myriad of other issues, health related and also food security, that are, that are also these communities are facing. And I think that it's incredibly important for us to to consider that simultaneously while also thinking of the impacts of climate change. And this one group was looking at the, um, the questions of how the climate was, in, climate change was affecting uh, the availability of food, which is collected out on the land, and looking at ways to store and harvest that food, or think about ways to design a community that could be more coupled with the seasonal cycles of how food is, is uh, um, is, is collected. Uh, so there's a series of like small installations that were using uh, reused materials that could could be um, ways to productively contribute to you know uh, a more secure sort of few food situation. Um, but it's again very speculative, and the ultimately the idea was to produce a kind of operating manual that um, some of these communities could use to think about how design from the, the idea of buildings and the, the organization of buildings in relation to each other could form um, uh, a better configuration of uh, or, or, or contribute more successfully to, to how uh, uh, food is, is, is preserved. The importance, though, in our work that we ascribe to talking with um, stakeholders and residents and community leaders in Alaska is uh, can't be emphasized enough. Um, this is a, a meeting with uh, Charlotte and Eugene Brower in, in Barrow, Alaska, and they're uh, elders within the community, and we're telling us a lot about some of the things that they've um, faced through the years and how we could potentially engage. 
as designers. One really remarkable quote that Eugene said during our meeting was, we, we used to bury our homes in the ground and our people in the sky. Now we bury our people in the ground and our homes in the sky, and we have been cold ever since. And I thought that was actually a kind of interesting uh, reflection on the kind of condition that's happening, or has happened. So our students, with our students, we continue to explore and uh, investigate the context of the Arctic and at the same time bring people to UVA and to Charlottesville to talk about um, uh, our work and also to learn about what others are doing in their research. This is an image from a recent uh, um, panel discussion at the Women's Global Leadership Forum at UVA in November. We had Alice Rogoff and Claudia Murray come to talk and also we share some of our work with them. Another really exciting thing that's happening now is our work with Bob Ortung and the Arctic Pirate Group to develop um, uh, an Arctic uh, Urban Sustainability Index. And we're incredibly appreciative of uh, funding to the National Science Foundation for this work. And Lena and I, through the Arctic Design Group, are spearheading the effort to understand how design is playing a role in developing uh, indicators uh, and, and sustainability uh, best practices for Arctic cities. And so this work is ongoing, but we continue to look at and explore a range of, of northern cities to develop a clear idea of what, what, is, what is sustainability. How, what does that mean from a design perspective? Some recent developments too, and this is pretty much my, my last slide, is to um, a new NSF grant to bridge between science and design. Uh, it's something with the collaborators at UVA. We're really excited by this opportunity to um, start to develop an Arctic uh, research platform at UVA that crosses disciplines. Um, a kind of uh, idea that uh, of co-production of knowledge, which I think is a really exciting way um, forwards. My last. So that, uh, for those of you on the webinar, you probably can hear that. Um, it's a really wonderful, it's a, actually my last slide. The, uh, it's one of our students up in um, Longyearbyen, and she's talking about um, studying the uh, waste sewage, the sewage system in Longyearbyen, which is a total disaster because it just dumps raw sewage out into the, the harbor. But it was this wonderful moment of her just dedication of traveling to Svalbard and spending her time completely invested in understanding what the sewage system is doing and not going out and photographing the, the sites, you know, so, so to speak. But it was just you know, a very exciting moment. And I think that you know, all of our students bring a kind of intensity and dedication in their work. And I think that you know, hopefully we'll be able to contribute meaningfully to the conversations about how the Arctic should and can develop in a, in a better way than what has been done in the past. Uh, and on that, I'll, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that really interesting uh, picture of uh, design and architecture in the Arctic. That was great. Um, we can take questions online. We can take questions in the room. Does uh, anybody have uh, questions in the room or online? Feel free to type them into the chat box. Uh, first question that I have is, uh, um, in terms of the history of uh, uh, design and architecture in the U.S. Arctic, how did we get to this point with uh, houses being sort of plunked down in the uh, um, in the Arctic that may not be appropriate for that environment? Yeah, that's a great that's a really great question. Well, I mean, some of the early um, development that that happened was through military installations through Cold War, um, and you know, I think that. You know, the, the the tricky thing, of course, is that logistics speaking and isolation speaking, how do you how do you move materials to this area? There aren't really building materials, so so you're left with this approach. And you can imagine, from a from a from a from a military perspective, import modules, put them there on a ship, and then then insulate and and heat them. And you know, typically with diesel generators, um, and so. So that, that is one, one aspect of what has contributed to the current, especially in terms of the number of diesel generators in Alaska and all through northern Canada. But the other thing is, is that there's people that move to Alaska 
or move to the north have an expectation of comfort. What is the expectation? You're familiar, you come from the south, you want your colonial style house, and so you want to have that there. You want to, you want to uh, uh, feel that you, you know, that, that, you, that you feel comfortable. And so this idea is of being comfortable, I think in some ways, uh, have led to this legacy of people still building, you know, houses or buildings that are um, either from an economic standpoint or from a kind of cultural or, or um, standpoint are, are familiar to them. Great, thanks. Yeah, uh, please uh, press the uh, button on your microphone to talk. Hey, Matthew, I had a quick question. I was wondering, um, as you're thinking about design in the Arctic, how do you incorporate sort of public participation participation in that design, and how do you design to encourage public participation? I guess is more precisely what I'm yeah. interested in. How how do you, you know, shape buildings or public spaces that get people to be involved in the processes of running their city and thinking about the future of the city, that sort of thing? That's a great question, Bob. Thank you. Um, you know, there's, there's different ways to think about how, as a designer, you can engage with the public. And one is community-based design, where community is, is involved with the actual design process. And that happens. And actually, we've seen examples of that in Alaska. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I'm not that experienced in that process. But, but what I do know is that one of the most important things you do is listen. Um, and and in, in the time that we spent, particularly this past uh, fall, is to listen to what people have to say about uh, the conditions that are, the, 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 what they're facing and what, what things that they would like to have addressed. Um, I think that the second part in terms of engagement is to present people with, with clear ideas about what alternative futures could be for, the, for our community. So, so and, I, and this is actually you know, part of the kind of uh, public uh, feedback process that happens in a lot of um, public projects. Where you know designs are are presented and there's a t there's a viewing period where people can come and actually comment, um, so that's something that's fairly standard, um, and and I, and I think though that um, the the question is is does that does that happen enough? And I think that that probably there's actually it's interesting because um, that is a critical thing that can happen, but I I believe that that ultimately listening to what people have to say and coming back with several design options for them to be able to critique is, is, is successful. The thing that, I mean, this might be a little contentious, and I'm going to throw this out here, is that, and this is really tricky in terms of the Arctic, because basically we're faced with a legacy of colonialism that's gone and screwed things up for a whole population, uh, indigenous people. So how do we kind of come back and actually meaningfully engage with the communities in rural Alaska when we were actually the source of the problem to begin with? And so one of the things that's really exciting about the NSF proposal that we just had funded is we're actually going to um, have invite uh, some Alaska Native youth to come down to Charlottesville to be part of a workshop. Um, There's part of the Arctic Youth Ambassadors that the State Department has organized, which is pretty amazing. Um, we are in the process of planning to have a group of youth to come down to talk to them about design. Because I think that it's one thing to show up and say, hey, you should do this or do that. I, I'm, I'm questioning whether that's a really good strategy, particularly in smaller communities. Better to enable people to gain equity in the process of the future of their communities through, through, through showing them, hey, this is the power of design. And there's clearly what, what's, what's really amazing when you go to the Anchorage Museum, there's probably one of the most incredible displays of Native Alaskan um, art, um, not art, but but tools, clothing. It's also a kind of architecture. Um, and you see the amazing uh, techniques, technologies, and innovation that is there, all synthesized and beautifully curated. And you realize, like, how can this be part of the future legacy of, of Alaska in terms of these communities? Like this amazing ability to think about um, efficient use of materials and environment. That's something that, coming from the south, we can't just hope to arrive and tell people this is what you should be doing. We need to engage with, with those that are the future leaders. So that's, that's a long answer to your question, but yeah.
Yeah, related to that, um, there's a, a question from Svetlana Kravchuk says, uh, did you consider uh, traditional designs, uh, for example, housing, transportation, and other attributes of mobile living developed by nomadic communities in the Arctic? That's a, you know, that's actually one of the, it's a super nice question, and it's a critical um question because a lot of the problems that are happening right now particularly in going to Shishmaref is that you have a fixed community well let's rewind back to the history of how how these 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 communities have sort of become fixed to begin with it's because of schools um, a, a legal the requirement that there was a school in every community and so that locked people into place uh, and the schools were of course an imported model from the south that were fixed and then everyone had to live around the school. So now you have this nomadic culture, which was adaptable to the changing environmental, the extreme environmental conditions, uh, has now been, been basically uh, not broken, but, but uh, it's been disrupted. And so the idea of mobility is a super exciting aspect of how you move from one place to another. The, the tricky thing, of course, is infrastructure. Nobody wants to go back to living in um, um, sod houses and igloos. I mean, that's not me saying that that's Native Alaskans we've spoken with. I mean, everyone wants to go in and turn on a light and have a flush toilet or have a, you know, this is, this is something that, that, that we all share in common. Uh, the question is, is, how do you find a kind of marriage between the technologies and that, that are also about health, about sanitation, about food, about sharing spaces with uh, families uh, how do you how do you marry that with with the kind of current technological advances of of comforts this is a it's a critical thing but it's our fixed nature in which these communities are in place that is also causing the problem when conditions change you're not able to move to different places that are more amenable to different seasons but that's that's an awesome question we're looking at it now <laughs> So I have a, a question here from Diana Bull. It says, uh, given the rate of change to the environment in the Arctic, erosion, depth of active layer, and, layer, and so forth, and the close tie of communities to the land for livelihood, uh, needing to be close to the ocean, for instance, how does the concept of relocatability enter into the design process um, that you're developing for the Arctic? Yeah, well, I mean, I think this goes, that's a really super nice question as well, uh, clearly. Um, it's a very sophisticated, it's a very super nice question. The, the thing that, um, I'm going to go back to this quote uh, Jackie Bird um, said, in all the years he's been working in Alaska, um, and, and, and something that was reinforced to us as well in, in, in our research last semester, was the nature by which the home is not one place. It's actually, it's a territory, and people would move from place to place. Um, and so that... You know, ultimately, being close to the water is important. That's one of the really key things, uh, you know, for communities to be able to access the water. Um, but it depends on the season, um, and which which at which season uh, different type of foods are available. Um, and so, so I guess the question of relocatability is it better to be next to the water or inland? Well, conventional wisdom, if you read Harold Strub, uh, Bear Poles, for example one of the architects in northern Northwest Territories back in the day, um, was talking about the fact that every community needs to be on the water. Well, that's true. But but communities also work, you know, live inland as well. So I think this is something to be discussed with the communities themselves and to decide how do you think that, uh, you know, based on shoreline erosion, which one thing that, that was really fascinating last fall in arriving in Uktiavik in the end of September, uh, when the first winter storm had come in, um, and the sea ice had not come in yet, and the coastline was eroding massively, and I began to understand for the first time what it means when sea ice is not around for as long during the course of the year. Because the storms that come in, and if you don't have sea ice, which basically shuts down all the coastline, the shoreline erosion, you see this incredibly... Um, uh, Erosional. I forget the word this for this, but you you see this this incredible um, uh, loss of 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 land that's happening when you have sea sea ice around for for less often. So, so that actually was an, a real eye opener for me um, to understand the impact. Um, and so, I guess the question is: Is it how do we for communities that want to be on the water? How do you how do you address that? How do you address these incredible erosional environments? Uh, but Hopefully I've answered the question.
Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big challenge, and also with the uh, permafrost thaw affecting the erosion is a big issue, too. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. So um, here's a question from Jasper Hardesty. Uh, how have you balanced the needs and changes of the ecosystems and the physical processes with design to mitigate the negative impacts of, of on those uh, ecology focus rather than community focus? Wow, these are, these are such amazing questions. <laughs> these are a really, really, really great question. Well, well, the, the, the one thing that's for sure is that our approach to environment, um, the Arctic is, uh, environments and ecologies are incredibly fragile. I'm not an expert on it, but, but I do know that they are. Um, and the way in which uh, we have been in the past building in, and existing building settlements within these environments, I think has largely been um, neglecting what the environmental impact is. I mean, in fact, looking at what's happening in Russia, for example, the um, incredible environmental impacts that are that are as a consequence of these mono-industrial cities is incredible. And in developing a model of of living that that or building a community that in some ways is trying to mitigate the in adverse environmental impacts is something no one has, I don't think anyone has ever done. Because it's so difficult to build already in this context. It's a question of just economically making a, a place viable, let alone mitigating the, the adverse consequences on tundra, ecologies, shoreline. I mean, just look at Svalbard, Longyearbyen, one of the most advanced cities we visited in terms of design, dumps raw sewage into the harbor. It's a huge question. And it's an incredibly important one that, that in addition, as you're pointing out, the cultural and the environmental as aspects need to come together simultaneously. Um, we we um, were hoping by by working with uh, our, our some of our collaborators at at, at UVA, uh, Howie Epstein, is an amazing a colleague of ours, uh, to begin to look at another, also bringing on board ecologists as well, to understand how we can bring this question to the foreground in terms of our work. But no, that's, that's a fabulous question. Thank you. So um, the question is uh, from uh, Claude Williams, uh, turning to the uh, Soviet Union construction. Uh, uh, did they consider extensive permafrost thaw when they designed the uh, large housing blocks? And uh, how are they doing now with the uh, warming that's going on? Yeah. <laughs> Love these questions. Um, uh, no, they didn't consider permafrost thaw. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, for the available literature that I've been able to find, the Soviet Union, you know, there, there was a lot of research that had been done uh, and a lot of work that was published, but it tends to stay within Russia. And I think that's one of the great challenges that we face as designers is to tap into this incredible body of knowledge that the Russians have about and the past legacy uh, of how these cities were built. They were typically built through trial and error under great economic and political and social uh, pressures. Uh, Norilska is an example which I've written about. Um, and they were more concerned with making buildings stand up uh, and making cities functional in terms of not being buried in snow. And interestingly, one of the really surprising things actually that, that, uh, that, that, I, that I learned uh, was the, in my research was the fact that they designed these cities thinking about the well-being of children. And if you can design a city in an extreme environment that is viable for children, then you are basically choosing the lowest common denominator in terms of their sensitivity to lack of light, to extremes of temperature, to mold, to da da. Then you're going to make a place that everyone can live in. And that also affects the strength of families. And when people are living in these cities and working, you need to have str strong family units. And so that was a, a super interesting kind of part. But getting back to your question, the, the question of permafrost thaw. Uh, um, that is impacting buildings now. There are, there's a group at GW and the geography department, uh, Kolia uh, and uh, Dima, um, co colleagues of Bob Ortung, that have been looking in, in very in close detail at the impact of the um, of thawing permafrost on these structures. Uh, but they didn't really take into account um, the effect of climate change on, on, on permafrost thaw. They were, however, very cognizant of the fact that the infrastructure that they were putting in place in these cities was going to affect the permafrost. Because when you build large buildings, you need to supply them with heat, and with water, with power, and also waste. So all of this needs to be considered. Um, and so what they did, now what this tends to do uh, for large cities is create massive amounts of above-grade infrastructure that runs all over the place, tubes, pipes, et cetera, et cetera. 
So what they did is they buried it in the ground. Now, this is a very kind of counter idea. You're going to bury these heat producing elements in permafrost. Um, and so, but they weighed the, the pros and cons of this. And what they did is actually bury these concrete boxes into the ground, a kind of concrete sec, these kind of tubes, and then placed these elements within these tubes and then designed the city around this kind of below grade infrastructure. Um, knowing full well that there would be heat escaping from these, 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 this infrastructure and placing the buildings far enough away so that they would not be impacted. So they knew that thawing permafrost would mess things up, but the fact that there is a kind of more ambient change in temperature um, uh, is, is, is affecting per permafrost is not something that would, was factored in at the time. I have a very different kind of question from uh, Ann Smith, who says uh, that uh, she's a student at UIT in uh, Tromso, uh, Northern Studies, uh, um, and asking if there are uh, uh, plans to uh, get involved or opportunities for uh, for European students to get involved in the Arctic Design Group. We would love to have students join our research group. In fact, I can make a plug right now. We have a. a uh, a fellowship position available for our NSF project on urban Arctic urban sustainability from a design perspective that is available. And we'd love to have uh, uh, graduate students that might be interested in such a fellowship to join us. There is a postdoc position available at, at uh, UVA2 as well to look at uh, smart buildings and technologies in Arctic cities uh, just most recently. And thirdly, um, we are always keen to um, not only to have bright students from from Norway and other northern countries or elsewhere to come to UVA to study with us. Um, and please be in touch. We, we'd really like to hear from you. Great. No questions? No questions online? So, so with regard to the uh, looking forward, the design, um, how can we do better, um, avoid the mistakes of the past, and try to uh, build uh, communities in the Arctic that actually uh, work well. And maybe that that's sort of just general ph philosophical point, but do you have thoughts on how do we do better? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. So it's the big the big question uh, and one that we are we are learning uh, as we go along, but trying at the same time as being cognizant of the fact that how we we can contribute meaningfully to the Arctic varies from region to region. Um, and I think, as I said earlier, there's enormous lessons to be learned from how the indigenous people in the north have lived uh, and how they view the environment. I think there's, there's an awareness of the environment that, and, and actually living on the land that, that we don't have or don't, don't share with them, or maybe those that have lived there for a long time that are indigenous probably, probably do understand this much better than I do. But I think listening and, and learning from, from approaches to environment, because I think one thing that we can say for sure is that we're not doing a very good job anywhere in the world in terms of how we use energy and think about materials and how we think about environment. Um, and so in a really broad sense, as we use this term sustainability, which has very vague meanings, but I think it, it means that we're, we're not being we're being smarter in terms of how we use materials and more efficient in terms of how we're living. And we're trying to impact the environment less. Um, I think that uh, uh, um, uh, you know that that ultimately uh, we can learn from from indigenous groups about, about about past practices. The other thing that's actually um, you know I, I think this is a really amazing opportunity to to not just solve a problem for the Arctic in terms of like let's build better houses, let's build stronger communities that have let's say better structured in terms of community spaces or public space, et cetera, et cetera, or in terms of waste, where do you put garbage, how do you deal with sewage. But I think it's actually because of the difficulties of shipping materials to the Arctic to producing heat and energy, um, it's a kind of laboratory for, for us in a way to understand how to rethink our relationships to environment anywhere in the world. If you can do it in the Arctic, you, you can, if, you can, if you can rethink a kind of future city, uh, which there will be, I believe, um, about, about impacting the environment less and making a kind of healthier environment for people to live, that will be a model for anywhere um, in, in the world. Um, and you know, you're, you're, it's a really good question, but, and I'm not doing a great job at answering it, but I, I think it's, a, it's still for us a question of learning uh, and listening 
um, and beginning to to not you know go and say let's build a giant two kilometer dome with 40,000 people living underneath it, but let's look at a more um, holistic approach uh, that brings in, in into play many different perspectives from 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 a from from environmental systems to to cultures and and to, and to economics simultaneously. Uh, so that's kind of where we're where we're headed. Um, but but thank you. Thank you. And actually, uh, there's a, a comment from Lena Cho on, on that last point that uh, uh, she talks about. Uh, we have to listen to the communities. We have to listen to the environment. We have to work within and outside of our own disciplines, work across boundaries to generate the momentum for changes that are effective and meaningful. And I think that's a great note to finish on yeah. because, uh, you know, at Arcus we work so hard to bridge those uh, boundaries and to uh, help people to work together across uh, different disciplines and knowledge systems and geographies. And thank you so much for a great presentation. Let's uh, thank uh, uh, Matt one more time. Yeah. No, thank you again. Thank you. Let me see uh, there. All right, so I just wanted to uh, conclude uh, with uh, a few announcements of upcoming events. I invite everybody to come back for our future uh, seminars that we're going to be having. On April 18th, uh, Dr. Nong Hong, uh, who is the Executive Director of the Institute for China-American Studies, um, recently released an interesting report on uh, China in the Arctic. Encourage you to come back and uh, hear about that uh, developing issue. Um, and on May 11th, uh, Elizabeth Arnold, formerly with the uh, National Public Radio, is going to be speaking and talking about her experience with uh, the Arctic and the media. Um, other uh, things that are going on, if you happen to be in Anchorage, I encourage you to uh, visit and uh, sign up for. Registration is open for Anchorage Arctic Research Day. Um, and uh, we'll be having a big celebration of uh, Arctic research broadly at the uh, Polar 2018 conference in June. Um, final reminder to uh, please fill out the evaluations, uh, which will appear on the screen shortly, as well as the uh, paper evaluations. Thank you so much for coming out, and um, have a great day. <laughs>